For this PowerPoint, I'd like you to be able to describe the neurophysiology involved in facial expression, particularly the nerves and muscles, and how these might play a role in socialization. I'd like you to be able to, to describe the observations of Redekin and Darwin regarding behavioral evolution and facial expression. You should be able to describe the relationship between Bell's palsy, facial expression and emotion, and describe individual response stereotypy and its implication for behavioral genetics. Emotional states are at least partially caused by the autonomic nervous system. The sympathetic uh, nervous system uh, would activate uh, the body, whereas the uh, parasympathetic nervous system would relax the body, including the face. Here's just a five minute video clip uh, that I think is very well done uh, detailing uh, some of these observations. The 40 or so muscles in the human face can be activated in different combinations to create thousands of expressions. But do these expressions look the same and communicate the same meaning around the world, regardless of culture? Is one person's smile another's grimace? Charles Darwin theorized that emotional expression was a common human feature, but he was in the minority. Until the mid 20th century, many researchers believed that the specific ways we show emotion were learned behaviors that varied across cultures. Personality theorist Sylvan Tompkins was one of the few to insist otherwise. Tompkins claimed that certain affects, emotional states, and their associated facial expressions were universal. In the 1960s, psychologist Paul Ekman set about testing this theory by examining hundreds of hours of film footage of remote tribes isolated from the modern world. Ekman found the native people's expressions to be not only familiar, but occurring in precisely the situations he would expect. Conversely, he ran tests with tribes who had no prior exposure to Western culture. They were able to correctly match photos of different facial expressions with stories designed to trigger particular feelings. Over the next few decades, further research has corroborated Darwin's idea that some of our most important emotional expressions are in fact universal. The degrees of expression appropriate to a given situation can, however, vary greatly across cultures. For instance, researchers have studied facial expression in people who are born blind, hypothesizing that if expressions are universal, they would be displayed in the same way as sighted people. In one study, both blind and sighted athletes displayed the same expressions of emotion when winning or losing their matches. Further evidence can be found in our evolutionary relatives. Comparisons of facial expression between humans and non-human mammals have found similarities in the structure and movement of facial muscles. Chimpanzee laughter looks different from ours, but uses some of the same muscle movements. Back in the 60s, Ekman identified six core expressions. Anger is accompanied by lowered eyebrows drawn together, tense and narrowed eyes, and tight lips. Disgust by the lips pulled up and the nose crinkling. In fear, the upper white of the eyes are revealed as the eyebrows raise and the mouth stretches open, while surprise looks similar, but with rounded eyebrows and relaxed lips. Sadness is indicated by the inner corners of the eyebrows being drawn inwards and upwards, drooping eyes and a downturned mouth. And of course, there's happiness, lips drawn up and back and raised cheeks causing wrinkling around the eyes. More recently, researchers have proposed additional entries such as contempt, shame, and disapproval. But opinions vary on how distinct boundaries between these categories can be drawn. So if Ekman and other researchers are correct, what makes certain expressions universal? And why are they expressed in these particular ways? Scientists have a lot of theories rooted in our evolutionary history. One is that certain expressions are important for survival. Fear and surprise could signal to others an immediate danger. Studies of humans and some other primates have found that we pay more attention to faces that signal threats over neutral faces, particularly when we're already on high alert. Expressions also could help improve group fitness by communicating our internal states to those around us. Sadness, for example, signals to the group that something's wrong. There's some evidence that expressions might be even more directly linked to our physiology. The fear expression, for instance, 
could directly improve survival in potentially dangerous situations by letting our eyes absorb more light and our lungs take in more air, preparing us to fight or flee. There's still much research to be done in understanding emotional expression, particularly as we learn more about the inner workings of the brain. But if you ever find yourself among strangers in a strange land, a friendly smile could go a long way. So the muscles and nerves responsible for this are well characterized. There are superficial facial muscles which attach to facial skin and deep facial muscles which attach uh, to skeletal muscle in the head. There are also two main cranial nerves involved uh, that are innervated or innervate the facial muscles. These are the facial nerve and the trigeminal. Impairment of facial expression is known to affect social interaction. Inhibition of facial muscles may be caused by Parkinson's disease, schizophrenia, and a variety of other disorders, including stroke. Bell's palsy is a, a well-known phenomenon that's caused by a virus and can cause partial uh, a facial paralysis. Patients with facial paralysis often report emotional disruption, and uh, you know, there's a lot of issues with communication that they report uh, in general. As you learned in the video, Darwin first suggested that expressions and emotions come from a common evolutionary ancestor. Uh, besides expressions, he noted the similarities in facial musculature, nerves in humans and non-human primates. Non-human primates typically communicate by lip smacking, like <laughs> this can uh, denote uh, you know, a variety of things, but it is also uh, one fundamental thing that it's used for is to establish uh, subordinate dominance uh, you know, relationships. I should also add that my wife, uh, Dr. Lindsay Hamilton, who some of you might know, uh, you know she was a primatologist. Uh, she worked with uh, primates for you know, well over a decade. And uh, you know, we can't go to the zoo without her communicating with monkeys. It's, uh, you know, uh, sort of a, a crazy thing, but the kids love it. But you know, Redekin is another one worth mentioning here, also described a little bit in the uh, video. Redekin described primate uh, facial expressions relative to humans uh, with similarities there involved. Uh, there are grimaces, uh, they, we both emit grimaces, uh, and we show a tense mouth in anger, and also a play face uh, in association with the human laugh. Here's just a side-by-side -side images uh, taken from some of the uh, original work by Ekman. Ekman, of course, was alluded to quite a bit in that video. Uh, you know, here you can see, uh, you know, the uh, similarities between Playface there in the middle. Uh, you know, that one, I, I think, uh, comes to mind. And then the scream, I think, is uh, very noteworthy, very similar there. Uh, you know, but you can look up Ekman's work if you want to uh, view more of this. You know, he studied this concept extensively. This is all based somewhat in the concept of evolutionary psychology, which studies how natural selection has shaped behavior. Emotions may coordinate responses to solve adaptive problems, and therefore they were naturally selected. Cooperating with a group, choosing a mate, avoiding predators, and finding food sources may have required emotional adaptation that involves facial expression. Finally, I wanted to touch on individual response stereotypy. This is the tendency of individuals to have the same response patterns throughout their lives. This would suggest that this is uh, somewhat genetic, inherited. Uh, and could be even adapted through concepts of epigenetics. But infants who are high reactors to stimuli with exceptionally strong reactions may later have increased phobias or fear responses as adults.